everybody. It's so nice to be a face to face with people again. So yes, I'll be talking about how to be a top 10% performer in the games industry. I'll start with a quick introduction to myself. So um, I'm Joseph Cairns. I'm CEO of Closer. Sure. Sure. OK. I'll stay close to the mic. I'm the CEO of Adventure Recruitment. As Rahul mentioned, we're specialists in the games industry. We only focus in the games industry. We've been doing it here in India for 16 years now. And we have a team of eight of us, uh, many of whom have worked for me for over 10 years now. And we've developed relationships with a lot of the top uh, clients and candidates. So my background is I grew up in the UK and I started recruiting there. I got uh, headhunted and moved to California. And then in, but this was IT recruiting. And then in 2002, there was the dot-com uh, crash. And so we were thinking what to do. And we went to a, a games conference, similar one to this, and picked up a load of positions. And I've been in the games industry ever since. It's, uh, you know, while other industries, everybody goes up, everybody goes down, the games industry is very good that it's always been going up. So as a creative industry, there's always some companies with layoffs and problems, but the net gain overall is going up. So, so when I first got into games recruiting in uh, California, we were very focused on the console market. We recruited some notable, we recruited for a lot of the top companies, but some uh, notable projects we did like for Electronic Arts Vancouver, we took over four of their hiring managers to London and hired uh, 25 programmers in a weekend and helped all of them relocate to work on some of the early FIFA games. We did uh, similar projects for Activision in, in Los Angeles. We were kind of, our niche was um, reaching new pools of candidates with all of our European connections and relocating them. Uh, but then in 2006, I sold up the shares in the firm I was part of, and I was thinking what to do next. And uh, I have an Indian wife from one of my earlier recruiting trips. Um, I met her, and she came and lived with me in uh, California. Um, but I love traveling and new challenges. So I said, well, let's move to India. I'd love to live there. And um, so I've been very happy to, you know, there's pros and cons to everywhere you live, but overall I love India. It's a great place. So bringing things up to, up to speed, I, you know, since I first moved here, India had a lot of, um, it was just art outsourcing work and we were still just doing a lot of international business. Um, but it's been so nice to see the industry, industry grow. So then sort of back offices for these big uh, Western publishers came in with um, Ubisoft, Electronic Arts, Singer, people like that. But especially over the last five to 10 years, it's been great to see um, how much original product and complete games uh, are being made, um, albeit mobile like Shane was talking about. Uh, but it's great to see people to be able to create original products here. And we've been helping companies to recruit uh, teams doing that, people like MPL, Moonfrog, Leela Games, Sub-Zero, to name a few. Um, we work across all of the main development areas. So that includes, um, obviously, developers is a, a major piece of what we do. But designers, product managers, artists, uh, producers. Um, so uh, on LinkedIn, I have about 23,000 connections across the games industry. So if anybody here would like to connect, I accept uh, all connection requests from anybody in the industry. So all right, let's get into some details. So who are the top 10 percenters in the games industry? So in my opinion, from my experience, these are people who, uh, they get great performance reviews and promotions wherever they work. They're great performers at uh, their jobs. They're people who 
whenever they interview, as long as it's a relevant job, they're very likely to get a job offer and get multiple job offers if they interview with, and get, get some choices. They're people who develop long-lasting relationships and reputations. And this is a really key thing that I'll talk about in more detail. They have quantifiable achievements in their career. So they're very goal um, and objective focused and measurable objectives that whatever they're doing, they have a vision of where they're going and what they're looking to achieve, which really comes in useful later on when they're describing uh, their experiences. And for me, a top 10 percenter could be at any stage of your career. So you could be just an intern or a junior level person um, that's outperforming others or all the way up. Even general managers and CEOs, they're not all 10 percenters. Even at their level, there's people who outperform the others naturally. So I thought I'd start with a bit of an update on salaries um, that we've been seeing. Uh, we see from interviewing so many people what they're on and what offers are going on. Um, uh, so I can report that the industry is cooled off a little bit from it was a year ago. A year ago, it was crazy. People were getting 50 to 100% salary increases, um, and the whole industry took a, a big step up. The market's still very hot. I think there's pretty much as many positions, if not more. Um, and good performers are still getting sort of 20 to 40% increase. Uh, particularly in demand are developers, uh, technical artists, product managers, and uh, designers. But um, across the board, across all positions, we're seeing high demand. So um, I should say these salaries uh, they're not just the top 10%. I'd say they're maybe the top 30 to 40% um, of uh, good candidates in the market are earning these rates. But they are also sort of people at uh, major companies or, or well-established companies in tier one cities. So if um, you're in a small bootstrap startup, you wouldn't expect to be earning this. You might be given equity instead or if you're in a tier two or tier three city where you've got less cost of living, it wouldn't be these. But this, this is an indication of uh, the mainstream uh, top 30 to 40%. So game developers, by that I mean uh, mid to senior individual contributors, um, roughly three to 12 years experience, are making annually 15 to 40 lakhs CTC. Uh, and that would be the cash uh, part, meaning fixed and variable. Um, and then there may be other incentives on top of this, uh, stock options, or now some of these clients are giving tokens and NFTs and stuff, but this is, these are the cash numbers. Um, lead programmers and tech directors we're seeing are earning between 40 lakhs and 1.5 cro. Um, the main bulk of that, I would say, is sort of 40 to 80 lakhs. Uh, so maybe the median would be about 60 to 70. Uh, but there are a, a, a significant number of people that are earning over one crow, which is great to see. Great to see people you know, coming up to still a lot cheaper than uh, employing internationally, but people starting to get what they deserve. And you know, hopefully some of these salary rates are also in, encourage more people, like Shane was talking about, people staying in the software engineering space, because that's the traditional way to make money. But gaming isn't just a, uh, a passion uh, a career to follow. It's also one you can uh, uh, be very proud of. Um, designers, uh, mid and senior, three to 10 years of experience would be um, 10 to 30 lakhs. Lead designers and design directors, um, 30 to 70 lakhs. Producers and product managers, 20 to 50 lakhs. Lead product managers and exec producers, 50 lakhs to 1.5 crore. 
Um, game artists, 10 to 25 lakhs. Technical artists, as I mentioned, are one of the highest demand, 20 to 50 lakhs. Oops, sorry. And finishing with lead artists and art directors, 30 to 60 lakhs. So, let's get into the detail of how to, to reach uh, your maximum performance and hopefully to be a top performer. How to get great performance reviews and promotions. So, I must firstly say, I've never been a tech director, an art director, or a creative director. Most of you here probably know more about making games than I do. I don't make games. But uh, I am in a fortunate position where I get to talk, our team as well, get to talk to um, you know, hundreds or thousands of people in the industry. Um, and so what I've tried to do that I hope may be of some use to you is to share some of the common traits that I see again with people that are uh, very successful in the games industry. And we see how their careers evolve and, and uh, how people do well. So, so a common trait we see of top performers are that they're continually learning and improving. So that often starts with picking jobs where they know that there's an opportunity to do something challenging and new. Maybe they have training programs or maybe they just uh, are aware that what they're doing is going to be challenging and they'll give you the freedom to pursue training to improve. Um, you know, often with these these things, it's easy just to get your head stuck down to being focused on your job and crunching things out. But the people who really take the time out, often it's sort of two steps back to go three steps forward to improve what you're doing. Um, and the people who, who make those efforts uh, 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 make them set themselves apart from uh, their peers. Um, top performers go the extra distance. So what I mean by that is that during crunch mode, they're the ones who work the latest, work the hardest. But I don't mean that you've got to work the hardest all the time. That's not sustainable. And interestingly, for me talking to some of these top performers, they're also the people ha who have some of the most interesting hobbies. So. You know, some of these, uh, many of these people that I talk to are into traveling, into trekking in the Himalayas, or cycling out on the weekends. Maybe they're into photography, and that's a creative outlet for them. And um, they, uh, they really go the extra distance in all aspects of their life, their work and their play. And... Um, that makes you a sort of happier, more interesting person, which feeds into the long-term growth of your career. So top performers almost always have a positive attitude to work. So what I mean by that is everybody has challenges at work, and a lot of people complain about it. But positive, top performers, usually have the attitude to see it as a good thing. So it's an opportunity to learn, maybe to fail, maybe to learn from that. Um, top performers minimize getting into office politics. So I have some candidates who say to me, oh, I hate office politics. I want to go somewhere where there is no politics. But that doesn't exist. There are there is some level of politics to a greater or lesser extent in all studios. So um, what we see from top performers is that they minimize uh, getting involved. They don't get involved with this bad mouthing, blaming other people or bad mouthing the company. Um, and, you know, whilst you do have to deal with it to some extent, they kind of have principles of being honest in their opinions, but doing it in a respectful way and being flexible and always thinking what's the best they can do for the company. 
So top performers have this uh, sort of taking responsibility for their career. So what I mean by that is that if they have a, a bad boss and they see that as an opportunity to take on more responsibility, if they're in a very difficult situation, they will look at, have I done everything I can? And they'll do that over a period of time. But it doesn't mean you have to stay there forever, right? Ultimately, if you say that, you know, we had all these challenges, but I did everything I could, ultimately they take responsibility and say, well, this isn't working for me, and they look to move somewhere else. Okay. So, common attitudes that we see amongst top performers Uh, so I had this just two weeks ago. So um, the CEO of, of a decent sized developer here was interviewing for a new tech director and we'd sent him two candidates. And he told me afterwards, he asked both of them the same question. He said, look, I'm planning after, you know, as we grow and in the next phase that I'll be hiring another tech director. How would you feel about that? And he told me that the first guy said, no, I don't like that. I want to be fully responsible to take care of the team. The second guy said, well, if he's good, that would be great for the team. We always have to look at hiring people better than ourselves. And um, I, perhaps you can imagine which one the CEO preferred, and that offer just came out last night for him. What if you're given too much work? I think this is quite common in India, that uh, people are pushed to the maximum. So top performers that you, we're used to chatting with have an outlook of being honest in feedback but being positive on what they could do. So you know, it might be a respectful way to, to do it at the right time, to chat with your boss and say, look, I think this might be too much, but I'm gonna give it my best shot. I'm gonna keep you updated on my progress. Let's see what ways there are to optimize or improve, but I'm just letting you know. So we hear a lot of stories of people saying that people just don't get the work done, they don't communicate. And so to say, no, just say yes, I can do it is not good. And, and, and to just get too overstressed and frustrated and say, say I'm not doing it is not good either. So what if you don't agree with the direction of your project? So top performers will find a respectful way to do it, not to bring it up in front of the whole team, but to speak directly with the person responsible and, and to share, say, look, I'm not sure this is the right direction, but I'm gonna do my best. Are you sure you don't wanna go these different ways? And to, sh to share that in, in a positive way. So I guess I'd, my thoughts for you are to speak your mind, but to be flexible too. To have empathy with everyone that you're working with, which might be your peers, your colleagues, your managers, the players of your game or the future players of your game. So this is kind of an easy thing to say, but a difficult thing to do. And if you really practice it in life, you'll set yourself above many of your colleagues. Um, there's an expression I remember that uh, everybody's listening to WIIFM radio. And what that stands for is what's in it for me radio. So if you can tune in to what everybody's motivations, goals, aspirations are, and to just show that you're busy with your own work, but if you show how you fit into the team and the bigger picture and what you can do um, for the team, you'll really set yourself apart. So, um, top performers, especially top 10 percenters, usually plan their careers. I remember there was a, a very famous study done in the US of graduates of top universities and they asked a, quite a large number of them what their plans and goals were for their careers, and some had them and some didn't. And they revisited those same, they tracked them down 10 years later, 20 years, it was a total of a 30-year study. And the people that had goals and aspirations, 
you know, albeit they may change and they may not end up doing exactly what they planned, but the people who had some kind of vision exponentially achieved a lot more. I think they measured it in terms of seniority, achievements, salaries and stuff, but uh, it's important to try to plan your career. So what are your long-term career objectives? Kind of bringing it back to the games industry, I mean, it could be different, I'm sure it's different for all of you, but some of the common themes that we hear that you may wish to think about are, do you want creative fulfillment? So especially designers and artists are keen to work. Often they're doing the work that's come up. Like Shane had mentioned, doing, there's not much console work yet. A lot of people are working on casual, hyper-casual games. Um, so is your plan that one day you want to work on a, you know, typically games people play mid or hardcore games. Do you want to build a game like the kind of games you, you like to play? Um, so that's a very valid goal, whether hopefully with companies like Keywords and the industry stepping up, there will be those opportunities or for you to set up your own studio uh, and to build the games you'd love to, to build. A lot of people want to grow into management. So they want to move senior, lead, start mentoring people, then into uh, managing, making a larger impact, a bigger impact at the studio. Some people don't want to get in management. They just want to become the best they can at what they're doing, to be the guy that people come to within the studio to help them with everything, the guy that's sent out to pick up all the latest technologies and techniques. Do you want to move abroad? So I like it in India, but a lot of people are interested at least to go abroad for a bit and come back, or some people love it and stay out there. That's a very valid goal, and then you can start planning around it and what skills are needed or experience to do that. Do you want to save lots of money? That's perhaps a natural one everyone has, but I encourage people to think about this in terms of bigger life goals about fulfillment, not, not just about uh, uh, how much money. So have you thought about where you want to be in three years, five years, 10 years time? So, you know, this may evolve and change as you get more experience and you mature, but to at least have some kind of roadmap and then you can navigate as you go. And then once you have that longer term vision, you can bring it back to what do you want to achieve in the next three and six months. So it may very much impact your decisions at your current studio to say, look, if I do a good job on this project, will you move me on to that other game you want to work on? Or what do I need to do to get that promotion into management? And, or, or if you're interviewing and changing jobs to assess the companies based on whether they fit towards your longer term goals. Okay, so a question. Do top 10 percenters stay with one company or do they work with many companies? So I have an, an, an analogy that it's like riding elevators going up in a tall building. So if at your studio right now you're moving up fast, you're getting great experience, you're learning new things, you've got the opportunity for promotions, then ride that elevator, ride it as, as far and fast as you can. But if things are slowing down, you're doing the same old work, studio's not doing so well, then that's the time to start considering switching to another elevator, another opportunity that can keep you moving up. So I would say to be very careful of changing jobs before at least one year, it won't look good. Uh, companies that talk to you will assume you're a job hopper that's done it just for the money. Um, but on the flip side, I would say to stay with a company for three or more than three or four years is usually robbing you of the opportunity to broaden your experience. If you enjoy it at your company and you're in a great position, then there's no harm in doing that. But if you really want to maximize your chance to be a top performer, um, so I was chatting just yesterday with uh, one of the other curators uh, here at IGDC. Uh, he's a director of engineering at one of the biggest uh, studios here. And before meeting, I was just checking his background and I saw that he had worked for six or seven companies, all one to two years experience. 
Um, and he, he did tell me in interviews he had to explain it and justify it, but it was just enough that he wasn't uh, seen as only money grabbing, he had reasons for it, but because of that broad experience he's got, it's directly contributed to why he's now at the, the highest levels. Um, one, one extra point I just make when you're switching jobs, switching elevators here, is that don't expect a promotion with it. So let's say you're a senior, senior programmer, and you want to become a lead programmer, don't expect when you get a new job that they're going to immediately give you that lead programmer position. You know, unless you're switching to a much smaller company or something, they will give you the same title, but th what you will get is most likely a better salary, but more importantly, the new, new and different experience, and um, the opportunity you will be picking is a place where you believe you can become a lead programmer pretty rapidly there. Okay, so how do top 10 percenters get multiple job offers? So this is a culmination of a few factors, some of which we, we talked about a little bit. Um, but one of the most important aspects is to develop long-lasting relationships, good long-lasting relationships with colleagues. So. People might not realize this if they're in their first job and all they're focused on is what they've got to do. But if people remember you as that great team player, the guy that got, or girl that got the job done and was great to be around, in five years or ten, certainly in 10 years time, most of the people you're working with will most likely be working at other studios. Um, maybe not immediately they get there, but after they've been working there and established themselves, and new positions come up at that studio, they'll be recommending you, and when that company reaches out to you, they'll already be 90% there that they want to hire you. They'll be selling to you on why you should come and interview, why you should join them, and th there'll be some interviews, but it'll be largely be a, for uh, a formality because of the credibility you already have with someone working there. So that, I would say, is the number one way for you to build a long-term career if you're progressing well, you're working at a good company, you're getting promotions, then recruiters like us or recruiters directly at uh, development studios will see that. They'll notice it on LinkedIn or hear about you and they'll be reaching out to you. So top performers do well in interviews. Some of them aren't that practiced if they've been busy working, they haven't interviewed for three, four years and we do help them prep. But with a basic bit of practice and prep, they demonstrate in the interview some of the things we've talked about. So quantifiable, quantifiable achievements, very goal focused. They talk in a positive attitude, the problems came up. So they don't say, oh, we couldn't do this because of that problem. They'll say, oh, this problem came up. Here's what I did. Here's what I couldn't do. They'll really demonstrate their, their positive attitudes. Top performers will usually choose their next job based on long-term growth. It won't be about money. Now, actually, to do this usually will mean maximizing your longer term earning potential, but people will prioritize choosing jobs that will take them further rather than just the, the short term money goals. Top performers get good secret references. So what I mean by secret references, often when we're talking to hiring managers that are at the final stages, they say, oh, the person's great, I think we want to offer them but I just want to check up on them. And these aren't the references that you give, that everyone knows will be great. These are references where they call, they see who's working at the company you're at or the company before that, see who they know, a friend of a friend will introduce them and they'll say, oh, what's this guy really like to work with and find out. So you may not even know this is happening. It's very hard to uh, prepare for this except to be great throughout your career, to be a good team player, to never have burnt bridges that can come back and bite you, things like that. 
some top performers, I always quite admire this, not everyone, but some of them have career mentors. So when somebody gets a, a job offer, especially when they've got a few job offers and they're thinking which one to take. So smart candidates say, well, I've got to think about it. I've got to talk to my wife. It's always a smart thing to do. But the really smart guys say, I need to chat with my mentor. This is typically like an old boss that you've kept on good terms with, you keep in touch with. And you'd be surprised that people really like being asked for their help and advice. So you're really not troubling people. It's nice to keep in touch with them anyway, but then when this situation arises, it's the perfect chance for you to uh, call them up and say, hey, which do you think is a better company? Here's what, they're, here's what they're saying the job will be and the growth will be to get their advice. Okay, so I have a little bit from the other side. So obviously we sort of sit in between helping candidates and clients. So advice uh, I have to share with employers who want to hire top 10 percenters are uh, to get the candidate excited to work for you, okay? Now surprisingly, this often doesn't happen as a priority. A lot of interviews happen where they just go straight into screening the person. Have you got the skills? Why do you want to work for us? This kind of thing. But especially with top 10 percenters, it's a bit like rolling out the red carpet. It's important to get them excited about what you're doing. And to do that, you need to know a bit more about them. Because as we've discussed, everybody has different motivations. Some people are excited on the games that you're working on. Some are more interested by the technology. Some are interested by the uh, growth opportunity for their careers. So once you know that, you can present those aspects of your company to get them really excited so that they put in their full effort and they, they continue throughout the interview process with you. So to have a good process from beginning to end. So what I mean by that, maybe a sort of extreme example of it, is a candidate that's been rejected. How might they talk about your company? So the ideal situation would be, a, you know, and we have this sometimes, but again, it's not the, the norm, is that they'd say, ah, oh, damn, I didn't get the job offer, but I really love what they're doing. They've given me some pointers. I'm going to really work on myself over the next year, and I'm going to apply in a year's time. More often than not, like, candidates will often say, oh, okay, I'm glad I didn't get that one. I didn't like the company. They rescheduled the interviews. I didn't get to learn much about what they're doing. They made me do a massive test. They never even called me first or, uh, or even called me after the interview. I just got after the test I invested 20 hours in um, to explain what I could have done better. They just said I'm rejected. So I advise companies to be very open about the good and the bad, or let's call it the pros and the cons. If there's some things about your studio that may not be so good in the, in the history, maybe there's been layoffs, maybe there have been some other issues. If candidates don't know about it at the beginning, if you do get to advanced stages and you're offering them, then they'll certainly look it up. You know, these websites like Glassdoor, you have to take things with a bit of pinch of salt there because there's uh, uh, disgruntled employees. But if there's a lot of bad things you can learn about there or you'll hear word of mouth about how they treat their employees and stuff. Um, if you're upfront about these things and say, oh, this had, just so you know, this happened in the past, this is why, this is how we've addressed it, starts to build a trust with a candidate that they could really trust making a move to your company. Don't lowball candidates with your job offer. So what I mean with that is that we have some clients even if the candidate's not expensive, let's say some of them are towards the lower end of their budget, they'll still offer a bit less. It's like negotiating in a shop or some, or, you know, a market stall or something that you always got to ask. But it really sets a bad tone with the candidate because even if you then put it up, they turn it down and you put it up to what they originally wanted, it leaves a bad taste that you're not comfortable paying what they're looking for and that you've had to stretch 
to do it. So we, we do a lot of work to talk to candidates and understand what that number is so we can advise the client uh, uh, to, to get it right first time. Okay, so that's me sharing a few of my thoughts that I hope, uh, you know, you guys know how to make games, but I wanted to try and give you a bigger sort of picture view on planning your longer term career. Um, if any of you would like to contact me directly, I've put my email up, or as I mentioned, uh, I'd be very happy to connect on LinkedIn. Uh, but I think we have time for a couple of questions, maybe one or two because we're running late, so we'll try and get them a little closer on schedule. Um, does anybody have any questions? Everybody's ready for lunch. We have another speaker then. Oh, oh sorry, I can't see. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, your opinion on some generalist roles in the game development industry. Sorry, I couldn't hear the, your opinion on what? Generalist roles, like uh, business roles and uh, uh, like on the business side of things rather than the on business the side. That's it. I mean, we don't do a lot of those positions. I tell you, we we focus largely on game development. So all the people making the game. Uh, we do a little bit of marketing. Do you mean, let, let me clarify a bit, are you talking about like with an outsourcer doing business development to get new clients or, or what, what kind of business are you talking about? Basically, uh, the people working on monetizing the game inside the studios. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, sorry, we do. Like product managers are very focused. We've got a number of positions at the moment where uh, that's a very high demand area. Product managers who, you know, it's so important to um, these free to play games to get that pinch point just right that, you know, you keep the funnel wide with enough players coming in and enjoying it, but you, you've got to make money too and, and when's the right time that people are happy to, to pay, or at least, you know, five or 10% of them are happy to pay. Um, so that's a very high demand area. Is there anything more you wanted to know about it? I'll get in touch with you on email then. Yeah, please. Yeah. We'd be happy to understand where you're at in your career and, and see if we have anything suitable for the next step. Thank you. All right. I think we have one time for one last one. Hello. Okay. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned uh, something about uh, studying abroad. So I just want to know, like, studying abroad uh, on game development is better or uh, uh, learning things through experience is better? Okay. So I was talking about working abroad. Studying, we, we but, but I'll still answer your question. I would be very careful of studying abroad. Whilst it's, it is definitely a great place to study, it is hugely, you know, coming from India and the, and the exchange rates and everything, it's hugely expensive and it doesn't guarantee you a job at all. What is most important that clients, I think someone asked, asked in the, the last talk um, about uh, if they need a degree or not. I mean, we work with people who've got more than three years experience and clients don't even look at degrees after you've got experience. So. I, I mean, if you have the budgets and, and you're interested to travel abroad, go study there. But a much safer, more economical bet will be to study here. Study and do as well as you can on the course, but even if you get a job offer, the key thing is to break in. I know that question of how to get into the uh, games industry is a whole separate talk, but it's difficult, right? So if you're studying and you get a job offer, I would even say go take that or finish your studies and hope that you've done well enough and, and that you, you'll get your break that way. Does that answer your question? Yes. Whoa. Okay, thank you. All right, one last question. So, uh, it was a very interesting talk. Thank you. Beautiful insights. So I want to know, so uh, in, the, like, in the current scenario, uh, multiple uh, uh, abroad companies are also looking to hire the Indian talent. And I'm sure like you work with both the Indian clients as well as the 
for foreigner clients? We do, and we have some international opportunities right now. Right. But it's not as easy as you'd think, even for top performers, because the US is where we uh, had so many clients, but the visas are uh, very difficult. Yeah, so I've also seen like a lot of opportunities in the remote, uh, <coughs> remote area. The remote space. Right. So uh, my question is, uh, what is the di differences would you categorize like, uh, in the mindset and the uh, um, process uh, between Indian uh, clients and the uh, foreign companies? I'm sorry, I only caught the first bit about you. It's asking about remote stuff. Can we ju just test the mic and then... And hello, hello. Well, okay, are they getting you a new mic then? Uh hello. Yes, is it better? That's, that's good, please. All right, so the, my question is, uh, how would you categorize the difference between the US company uh, looking to hire remote the Indian talent with, uh, is res with respect to Indian clients? Like what are the differences in their mindset and in the process of overall recruitment? This remote work, remote working as like an individual, um, ex from our experience, that's for experts, right? So we have technical, we had a technical artist here in India we got him a remote job from the UK with a um, 60,000 US dollar salary, but he got two other job offers for $80,000 just to work from home from a real cheap part of India. So that is going on, but it's on case by case basis and it's really when you're at the top. They're not gonna do that for anything, you know, even a mid or a senior. They wanna have seen that you've already worked on something very close. I think this guy had already worked on console and stuff which they're crying out for. Um, so remote work, while it's a growing market and people have been telling me to look out more for it, uh, you know, the market for us is, it, there used to be more contract positions we did in the US. It's more of a part of the, the business culture there. Here in India, it's 99% all full-time jobs. And then there is this sort of hybrid work from home, work from office, some client. There's that kind of thing going on. But I think you're talking about the full remote getting work from top right. studios. Right. Yeah, yeah. That will kind of, yeah, that's hard to, to search out. It will sort of come to you if you're at that level. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.